Okay, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Tomoyuki Yamakami, um, who's going to talk to us about quantum cryptography. Thank you very, very much. And I appreciate and listen, all of you to, uh, to be here, and, um, and also the Leslie's you know, who give me you know, a very good opportunity to present my work. Well, I'll use the order of my work on the quantum cryptography. Um, Is there a USB thing that you need to put in the computer? Yeah. Well, maybe it's the file. Really. That's okay. I'll just look at it. Sorry. Um. Well, today is now I'm going to explain about the quantum cryptography and quantum cryptography has been, has proven to be uh, very effective and very useful uh, in practice. And uh, that is embedded in almost three de decades ago, but still you know, a lot of people are actually interested in, in developing a crypto system. And uh, this talk is focusing on a uh, particular uh, tool called the computational indistinguishability of quantum state. So I'm going to explain some of the, you know, that, you know, the jargon set later on. But here, you know, uh, the main caveat of this talk is a presentation of the secure public key crypto system. And I'm going to explain what it is and how it works. Oh, sorry. It's a little bit done away. Um, so why we need the quantum information? Because there is a limitation in the current uh, quantum uh, the computer technologies. For example, you know, we are actually, you know, every year, you know, we are uh, to deal with computer makers you know, making the computer chips smaller and smaller. But you know, there is a physical barrier that you know, after that, you know, we can't make the chips smaller. Then what do you want to do? Because you know, we, are, we have tons of problems that should be solved, but not efficiently solved yet. So, so we had to make the computer faster. How? So a lot of people are actually interested in, uh, in uh, different media because I mean, uh, maybe just to think of, you know, just to throw away the you know, idea of using the standard chips. But you know, we will only we will, we will use the uh, quantum mechanics to build the computer. That could be faster. And the uh, important thing is the you know, information is a physical object. So, that, you know, so why don't you use you know, the physics to manipulate the information? So that's the starting point. Now think about it, you know, the very uh, simple question, like the factorization problem. So the given you know, negative integer n, and we are asked to find you know, all prime factors. Right? For example, you know, we have 33,957. So the factors are 3711. It's very simple, right? And, but the unfortunate thing, you know, if the number gets bigger and bigger, we don't have any classical, or the, when, I, when I say the classical, it means you know, the existing computer, you know, compared to the, the quantum computer. The classical computer <coughs> can't solve the, you know, factorization problem in the very efficient way. Um, take a look at this example here. Now, suppose you know, we have a number like this. Oh, sorry. I just show them the <laughs> solution. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just one single number, okay? So then, you know, think about it this way. Okay? It's enormous number, and it takes you know, so many days and hours to find two factors. Then actually, you know, to get this result, you know, we ran some 80 computers for three months consecutively, and then we found, finally found two factors. How you, you, you understand it's how inefficient to get the result? So this is uh, at the, the table showing that the, um, for example, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the number of 1,024 bits, so the, the, the natural number is represented by the, uh, 1,024 bits, then and if you use a computer uh, in 2006, it takes you know, two to the fifth years, but you know, the computer can be evolved 
according to the Moore's law, then the computer gets faster. So it takes only 38 years to find the factors. But if you double the number of the bits, then we still need 10 to the 12 years. But here. And if you <laughs> use a quantum computer uh, with the speed of 100 megahertz, then even we have the same number of the same uh, bits, 2048 bits, we only need 36 minutes to solve the function problem. So you see it's how fast the quantum computer can, can be, right? And quantum computer can do um, it's partially faster, as we see, and also the uh, RSA crypto system can be easily <coughs> broken because an RSA crypto system is based on the factory. And also, uh, we can do some database search faster than the normal computer does. And quantum communication uh, use, uh, can do quantum teleportation. So this is the way that you can actually send the quantum information without sending physical object. So I'm going to explain this one later on. This is actually it's a little bit spooky. Yeah, so <laughs> the, uh, uh, the Einstein doesn't like this idea. Um, the quantum cryptography can do the, uh, some secure communication. So that's the uh, topic we are going to, uh, uh, to go. So now, um, we go back to the classical information. So the basic unit of the classical information is bit, zero or one. Now, the quantum world, what we use called the quantum bit or qubit in, the short, in short, um, to represent the quantum information. So what it is, um, we always, we go, uh, the traditional is we will use the Dirac notation, uh, the Dirac notation, and so this bracket notation, the bracket zero represents the classical bit zero. Okay, the bracket one represents the classical bit one. So it, then, we will take a look at the actual physical object, right? And if you look at it, there's a very tiny particle, like an atom or uh, whatever, you know, they are actually in a spin. Uh, it should be spinning, actually. <laughs> um, I guess it's because it's not a very tiny particle. That, that's a very large thing. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it should be spinning. Anyway, um, so that we can actually decide if it's a head. So which direction that the spin head actually is okay. uh, So the, 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 if the spin head is uh, looking up, then we actually you know, uh, consider this is actually bracket zero. But if the spin head goes down, then we consider this is spin head, uh, the bracket one. So that this, uh, these two states actually represent the classical one and zero. So now, um, think about this whole entire the part the spin head can be possibly projecting this way or that way, that way, right? This is actually, you know, infinitely many possibilities between the zero and one. So something like this one. So the quantum state is a combination, linear combination of zero and one. And uh, if you're familiar with the Fox sphere representation, so um, if you have the zero here and the one here, and then the this point has been represented in this way, right? It's the angle uh, theta here, and this is uh, phi, uh, uh, psi, uh, phi here, and then uh, we have yeah, right? And another possible representation is the uh, apple. And so usually it's an electron uh, orbiting the nucleus. And the important thing here is, you know, the one single electron can be, it can exist in the two different levels. So this one is considered to be a bracket one. This can be considered to be bracket zero. So we have the electron actually exists like, well, this is actually a single electron. Well, so we can't really draw a picture like that one. It looks like you know, the cloud here. Existing at the same time 
in the orbit 0 and orbit 1. So that's the, uh, the state we call it the superposition. So that the electron exists in the superposition. So, so we can actually have a you know, physical object to represent the qubit. So now uh, we can actually put those particles in order from 1 up to n. So that represents n qubits instead of one single qubit. Right? So we write it down, we write down like this one here. So the phi is the quantum state consisting uh, in composed of n qubits. <coughs> so now uh, we just move on to a little bit more mathematics. Uh, instead of writing bracket notation, we use the vector notation. So the zero is one zero, and one bracket one is zero one. So the super sorry, I just I have to erase this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, superposition. <laughs> Uh, means you know, the linear combination of 0 and 1. That means you know, the, the, the linear combination of this vector and this vector, like this one. And those coefficients alpha and beta are called amplitudes. And usually it's an amplitude of complex numbers. So, uh, so if you just represent the uh, quantum state in this form, well, usually alpha and beta are complex number. That means you know, we are actually dealing with a four-dimensional world to represent this one single qubit uh, here. And the one uh, condition is that the, uh, the, the no, this is actually the vector here, right? And using zero and one. So the size, the length of this vector has to be always one. So that's the only requirement. We need. So that's an alpha square plus beta square has to be one. Right. Uh, the addition of two uh, squares has to be one. So now uh, we'll explain the uh, the relationship between the quantum information and the classical information. So now I want you to ask you the last simple question. So how many classical bits? can be encoded into the n qubit. So we have an n qubit, right? The answer depends on what situation, or what things you have to think of. The, uh, one of the famous theorems in the quantum information theory says only n bits. So we gain nothing. You know, n plus two bits can be encoded in just n qubit, right? But uh, here is a technique called dense coding, together with the technique called quantum teleportation. Then we can actually encode two n bits into this n qubit, so that we can double the size of that, you know, uh, cluster bits to be stored. So now another one is the quantum fingerprinting. So the, if, you, if you're familiar with the fingerprinting in a classical sense. Then so we actually expand this one into a, a quantum uh, realm. Then the quantum fingerprinting encodes two to the n bits into this n qubit. So this is an exponential, exponentially large. Okay? But if you use a complex amplitude, do you remember the amplitude? Right? So that's a coefficient. Right? So that could be any complex number. Well, suppose you know, we have you know, any real number. So infinitely many bits can be encoded into real number, right? So the one qubit can possibly take infinitely many bits as the information. So that's the power of the quantum state. Um, so it looks very Fantastic, you know, so we can actually, you know, enormous amount of information, classical information can be stored into you know, one single qubit. So why, why, you know, so we just simply manipulate this qubit to, to, you know, compute, you know, factorization or whatever, you know, you have in your mind. But the problem here is that the observation, because then you know, the quantum state is so tiny and spinning, so we have to look at it to get the information, what is, what is stored inside this quantum bit. 
So that is called the measurement. So for example, then the spin head is looking at this way. And if you look at this one, so this quantum state is destroyed and passes to classical state. That means either 0, uh, zero or 1. So, but then we can take both of them. Right? And um, depending on the angle here, in this particular case, it, this angle is more closer to 1. So that means, say, 70% chance to get 1 and 30% chance to get 0. So this is actually according to the probability. You only get one state, either one, 0 or 1, but you know, with probability. So you never know, you know which you will get in a one single measurement. But you know, once you measure the state, state plus, there is no way going back. Um, for mathematically speaking, and uh, the, the measurement is actually working as a projection. So if you have a vector here, so that's the quantum state, one qubit, then it plus to this vector or this vector with this length. So this length corresponding to the probability of getting this one and this one. It's very simple, right? And sometimes we call it a projection measurement. Because you know, we are actually taking a projection. And another interesting thing about the you know, quantum state is that, well, so far you know, we only talk about you know, one single qubit, right? You know, we have uh, you know, one qubit, and then we actually look at the qubit, it collapses to either zero or one. But if you have uh, two qubits, then what happens? So now, the very interesting phenomena happens so-called entanglement. The entanglement is the correlation between two qubits. And for example, the you know, Bob has one qubit and Alice has one qubit. And they can create this particular state. Kind of how to read this? Is the red marked uh, bracket corresponding to the left side quantum state. And the blue one corresponding to the right side. Okay? And this is the uh, mixture of two states. So the first one is zero, then the second one has to be one. Or the first one is one, the second one is zero. So the two possible worlds exist with the same probability. Probability is actually the square of this one. So that means that 50%. The 50% chance you have zero, one. And 50% chance you have one, zero. Nothing else. So this is a special state. And what happens here is that if Bob, you know, here, Bob, measures his qubit, not talking about, you know, Alice's qubit, because then you know, Alice keep this qubit in the same place, okay? The Bob measures his qubit and finds out it is zero with some probability, right? Then Alice's qubit automatically plus to one. Because if this is zero, this has to be one. Right? If the, uh, the ball discovers one after the measurement, Alice's qubit automatically becomes zero. Well, in the classical world, it never happens. If you have a two bit, zero, one, right? You know, the first guy, you know, look at the one or flip it, you know, it doesn't affect the second cube, the second bit. So that's the, you know, the, 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 you know, the idea of the class the world. But in the quantum world, that kind of reasoning doesn't work. You go to the first qubit, you know, if you have an operation for the first qubit, that affects the second qubit too, without doing anything. So that is the, the part of the you know, teleportation. You know, you actually you know, affect the other information without touching. So now, so now I want to tell you, you know, how to do the quantum computation. So uh, those pictures are actually, uh, well, I took uh, them from uh, web pages. You know, those are actually the uh, prototype of the quantum computers. 
So this big machine, and this you know, you know, a very fancy machine, you know, those are actually you know, you know, dealing with the quantum uh, bit to do quantum computation. Um, I'm going to explain so what the quantum computation is uh, in the next slide. But, um, those are, well, you know, if you think about you know, the lot of computer in the classical world, you know, we have a huge machine in the, sitting in the lab, right? Yeah, and uh, the most, you know, the um, most sophisticated machine can handle nowadays a seven qubit, you know, the seven qubits to be manipulated at the same time. But, you know, the people want to expand seven qubits into 100 qubits. Because you know, do you remember that, you know, uh, if you have, uh, say, n qubits, then we can store possibly two to the n, many, you know, classical bits, for example. So that 100 qubits means the two to the 100 classical bits to operate, right? So maybe just, uh, just a question about the sure. entanglement. So mm -hmm. if, if I have n qubits, mm -hmm. is it the idea that they're all entangled? Yeah. If I manipulate the seven qubits, they're all That's right, that's okay. right. Yes. This is just a you know, simple example, but yeah, yeah, you yeah. can extend this one into the, any number of qubits. The entanglement goes to, goes to all mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So that's a very interesting thing. For example, then if you have a three, four, five qubit and take a zero, zero, zero plus one, one, one. So now that um, I want to tell you uh, it's a very simple way to see the quantum computation uh, circuit and gate. In the classical world, uh, if, if, for example, then if you are if you try to you know, solve you know, some you know, some mathematical question, and then we built a quantum uh, sorry a logical circuit to uh, decide whether you know, this problem is 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 in, is outputting yes or no, right? And um, so uh, the, the circuit is usually composed of uh, many gates, but you know, the, we can actually specify the, the type of gate. For example, you know, we, are, we only use you know, three different gates to build you know, a huge circuit like this one. And whenever, whenever you know, we find it in all zero and ones, and you know, it's building a value, you know, we can actually follow the calculation and get the result. Okay. So now we can expand this one into Quantum world. So the quantum bit, it looks like this one. So we have an input. So this is one qubit. And then we do some manipulation, and then we will get the outcome. So this computation here must be unitary. So it looks like it's a unitary matrix applied to the, you know, the first qubit. So that, that is the uh, alpha and beta. Um, then we will get the result. It's very simple. And um, the, the one important aspect of the quantum computation is that quant computation has to be reversible. That means if you have one qubit here, the outcome is one qubit, and then we can actually reverse the computation. That's why we have to have the unitary matrices. And if you have two qubits, so the first qubit goes here and the second qubit goes here, yes, then we have to have two qubit outcome. Right? So now the, the unitary matrix is really big, you know, four by four matrix. Because uh, to specify one qubit, we have to specify alpha and beta. Right? Now we have a two by two times two dimensional world. Well, just forgetting about the you know, complex plane. Okay. So now we have a four by four matrix to, uh, to manipulate the input to qubit. So that's the, uh, you know, the general explanation. But then, so now I want to tell you, um, show you exact, uh, the concrete examples. The very simple uh, operation uh, is called an identity, so that we do nothing. You know, if you have zero input, then the outcome is zero, you know, one has to be one, right? And another one is negation. It's a zero, one, one, zero, right? So zero, the qubit zero is going to be a qubit one, right? 
right? Uh, the one, the bracket one goes to bracket zero. So we just simply flip the Boolean value. But do you have, well, so this is actually the basis changes. But do you know that you know, the uh, quantum bit is actually uh, from beta, right? It's a mixture of zero and one. So that now come must be the mixture of the zero and one. And another interesting uh, gate is called the uh, Walsh Hadamard gate. So this is one, 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 minus one, and well, this is a coefficient uh, to make it uh, unity. And from <coughs> zero becomes the mixture of zero and one. And one becomes the mixture of zero and one. But what's the difference between them? This is plus, this is minus sign. If you just say you know, draw a picture like this one, uh, zero here and one here, we actually wrote it. The two coordinates at an angle of 45 degrees. So that's what we got here. And another interesting uh, operation is the I here, instead of the uh, just one. Right? And I is a square root of minus one. So uh, the result is we shift the, uh, the bracket one into a complex form. Well, uh, in the classical world, this kind of operation never applied. And uh, uh, rotation, uh, I didn't really uh, draw a picture, but uh, well, we can use uh, I here and here so that we can actually exploit the, uh, you know, the use of complex planes. And for two qubit system, um, this is a very uh, useful gate called C node. Or control mode. Um, this this works as like an if then else statement. If the first qubit is zero, then the second qubit is not changed. So we will get a output a. Yes. But if the first qubit becomes one, then we have to flip the second qubit. So the a becomes one minus a. So that's a zero goes to one, one goes to zero. Well, in general, so we have a mixture of the mixture of zero and ones. Then um, we get a mixture of you know, those states. So now um, we can use we can use you know, all those gates to build a quantum circuit. Just simply, you know, position those gates nicely so that you know, the input qubit is manipulated here and we will get the output. It's very simple. And also, uh, each gate is reversible because of the unitarity. Then, the whole entire circuit can be reversible. That means uh, we will take the output and then plug into the backward, the computation always goes backward. And then we will get the same impact as before. And the catch is that the, we can't store the quantum information in the sense that you know, we actually, you know, in the classical computation, um, we can actually compute some result and then store it and then make a copy it and then just change it. But then also later on, you know, we just go back here and then just uh, modify it again, right? But we can't do that in a quantum computation. So no point theorem says there is no copy machine. That means, well, if you have a unknown quantum state, and then we can create the uh, quantum state zero, and we actually change this zero into the same quantum state. So we, we don't have the copy machine like this. Well, the, the reason is very simple. Right? It's, a, it's a very elementary and professional level uh, exercise. Uh, if there is such a unitary matrix, we have a contradiction. Um, I do not have much time to explain the uh, very famous say, the quantum algorithms. Uh, but again, uh, just to give you just a, you know, the uh, description here. Um, the Shor developed the uh, very interesting quantum algorithm that actually solved the factorization, factorization problem. 
And um, in a classical sense, you know, we still require the, uh, the, the factorization, factorization requires an exponential time, but the Hughes quantum algorithm developed by Shorter, it takes only n square log n square time. n is the size of the you know, given input uh, natural number. Big size. So it's a polynomial time algorithm. And another one, another famous one is the database search. So supposing that we have uh, you know, the n locations and there is a unique key you know, hidden somewhere. Okay? And uh, the database is unstructured. So there is no structure. So that you have to open up the beach box and to, to find out where the key is. Right? In a classical sense, you know, we have to open, in the worst case, we have to open n minus one boxes. If the n n minus one open boxes are empty, then the last one is, you know, has a key. So you know we don't need to take any time. In a quantum algorithm, we only need to spare the n times to open the boxes to get the key. It's really fast. So now we move on to the quantum algorithm. <coughs> so this picture shows the uh, first. Uh, cryptographic machine developed by IBM in 1989. I didn't see the name of the actual uh, machine, but you know, the, the, the picture is you know, floating on the web page in the internet. So now, I'll explain how the teleportation works. Now, suppose that we prepared the uh, EPL pair, that is actually the 0, 0, plus 1, 1, and with a 50% chance. So the first one is zero, the second one is zero. Or the first one is one, the second one is one. So we have uh, two particles. So that the particle can be stored, uh, well, the one particle is taken by Bob, and Bob stores it in the same place. And also the Alice does the same, right? And just move away. Okay? The problem is that we can't see what it is. Because then if you see the particle, you need to destroy the quantum state. Right? So you have to keep it in the same place. Now, someone gives a quantum bit, one quantum bit, uh, to Alice. So of course an Alice can't see it, because then it's class two, they're just zero or one, right? So the old nice property of the pi will be gone. So now so Alice wants to this information to Bob, without actually sending this particle. How do you do that? It's very simple. Of course, Alice applies C0 to these two qubits. The one is actually taken from here, right? And then applies Hadamard gate and identity gate. And then measure two qubits. So two qubits class to either 0, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 0, or 1, 1, with the same probability. Okay, so 25 chance to get uh, some number here, right? This is a classical bit, A, B, or like a 0, 1, for example. So now, Alice make a phone call to Bob and tell him that um, I got 0, 1. OK. <laughs> so now the Bob re received this information. This is a classical information, two classical bits, right? And then applies some very simple quantum gate. So then, um, OK, oh, sorry, I had to say that. And the bulb prepares zero first, and then apply those operations. So the bracket zero uh, quantum state turn into pi after the operation. So, the important thing is that Alice does not send any information for, about this file. Only tell told her just two bits information, like a zero, zero, one, one, zero, one. But you know, those numbers, uh, those two bits, are obtained with probability. So she never knows what number that she will get. Right? So, um, more mathematically speaking, and, um, the first two qubits 
uh, belong to Alice, and the second two qubits belong to Bob. Well, actually, the Bob will have this one here. And you know, the dotted line here uh, represents the classical bit, like the uh, sheet well, Alice is. Take a measurement and then get two classical bits, and those are actually sent to Bob. And the Bob applies those very simple operations. And then this state becomes five. It's the same as here. And this is another circuit you know, doing the same thing, uh, using the three qubits instead of two. And also, we only apply in very simple uh, operations. Um, so this is a prototype of the you know, teleportation machine. Uh, he is uh, uh, checking out the, uh, the machine here. Um, so we actually have this machine. Because then it's not, you know, all the quantum operations are very simple, so that you can easily build a machine like this. Of course, you know, the, you know, the, the tuning is a very important thing, but it's really uh, sometimes hard we did a very good precision somehow. But anyway, so this is a teleportation. So now, uh, finally, so we we'll move on to the uh, main category of the quantum uh, power key uh, crypto system. And well, we will consider the two party uh, communication. Um, so now, as so an Alice and Bob want to exchange uh, information and back and forth. And in the uh, uh, there are some civil uh, situations. For example, Alice and Bob, want, you know, they run quantum computers, but they want to send the, the classical information, only classical information. So we, we just use you know, a standard channel, as a, you know, existing channel, to send in the classical information back and forth. But if you want to exchange the quantum information instead, then we need a quantum channel instead of the classical channel. And usually the quantum channel can be realized by uh, you know, optical fiber. So that actually sends the light. The light is also the particle, and we actually use this you know, photon to represent the qubit. But the classical information and the quantum information information are very different. So we can actually exploit this difference to build secure uh, encryption, yeah, encryption, uh, encryption. So here is a basic scheme of an encryption, uh, encryption method. And now it's an Alice and Bob. Alice want to send the Bob a document called the Playdex. So next, the Bob produce uh, two keys. And one is the encryption key, the other one is the decryption key. And the Bob sends one key to Alice. This is the encryption key. So now as an Alice use this encryption key to encrypt her document. So it is called, uh, which is called the cipher. And this ciphertext is sent to Bob through some channel. Now, oh sorry, Bob use decryption key to decrypt this ciphertext back to the original plaintext. Now there are two systems depending on the security of the channel. Right? Well, we are always assuming that this channel is insecure. So that anyone can eavesdrop the conversation, or maybe say you that you know, uh, going to to um, well cut this line or whatever you know they can do. And here, uh, this channel is either secure or insecure channel. And we have you know, two different names. And if the secure you know if if the Alice and use a secure channel, we call it the symmetric key or private key, okay, an encryption. And uh, if the channel is insecure, then we will call it an asymmetric or public. So 
Uh, the rest of the talk is focusing on this public key encryption. And why we have to uh, consider the public key in uh, crypto systems instead of private or uh, symmetric key crypto system? Uh, there are a number of the reasons. The one big reason is that um, a symmetric key system, we have to produce each key to each information, right? So if you have a large scale network, so you have to produce tons of secret key to distribute to each person, right? Well, it's, it's really um, economical, right? And, but then if you use a public key grid system, so you can actually produce one key and send, send it to everyone just only single key to uh, deal with the encryption. But the forward in a decryption, he only have you know, one decryption key. Right? So the two keys are enough to operate uh, even in a large scale network. So it's very common. Right? And, um, but the problem is that, well, you know, we do not really need to think this situation, but you know, the public key crypto system are a little bit vulnerable to mainly in the middle of the time so-called demanding because then someone pretend to be the receiver, right? And then we have a trouble. Usually you know, we will actually insert in another you know, uh, 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 you know, the uh, secure <coughs> uh, system to prevent that kind of thing happens. But the here, so now we actually forget about this uh, one and this for a while. So now, so now I'm going to explain our system. Okay. And now we need a little bit of mathematics here. Um, I just remind you the notion of the permutation and symmetric groups. The permutation is the uh, you know, one to one on to mapping from the one to n up to one to n. And S sub n is the collection of all permutations on, from one up to n. Okay. Now we restrict this S of n in the following way. We only collect the permutation of the following form. And if you take a uh, permutation twice, we go back to the, the original. But none of the elements goes to uh, stay the same. Do you understand? So this one, the two goes to two. That means this pi is not in the case of n. And um, another important thing is that you know, we can actually encode this permutation uh, into n log n bits. So now um, we go back to the, you know, the, the notion of the indistingu indistinguishability. Um, so indistinguishability referring to the, you know, the problem of the distinguishing the two quantum states. Suppose we have um, permutation, pi taken from case of n. You know, this permutation satisfies the, the, the previous condition. And we generate this, uh, these uh, two uh, quantum states. So this is the summation over sigma. Sigma is taken uh, is a permutation over some old permutation. And we actually create uh, those quantum state. And the only difference between two states is here, the first one has the plus sign here, the, the second one has minus sign. That's the only difference between uh, here and here. So we call it in a, uh, rows plus for the first one and row minus for the second. And now, we want to consider the complexity of distinguishing uh, low plus and low minus with high probability in, say, polynomial time on a quantum, uh, quantum computer. So if you know, someone actually pick one of them and send it to you, and you have to decide, so this one is low plus or low minus. Right? So this is the problem you have to solve. And it turned out to be this problem is something to do with 
a very well, uh, well known problem uh, called the hidden subgroup problem. I'm not going to explain this one in detail, but uh, there is a uh, very famous uh, problem here, and those are related. And um, earlier, I showed you that the short invented in a very fast quantum algorithm, but then Similar algorithm does not solve this problem. So we have to come up with a very um, you know, clever idea to tackle this problem. So, but what we can do here, uh, well, so we start with a very easy part here. Suppose the pi is given and the rho plus is generated. Okay. Now we can uh, easily generate this one, and we can easily <coughs> convert a rho plus to rho minus. And simply you can take the uh, facing coordinate. And another thing is, I told you that the distinguishing problem, you know, uh, distinguishing the two states, seems to be hard. But if you know pi, what pi is, then Distinguishing problem is very, very easy to be solved. So this property is called the trap door. Whether you know pi or you don't know pi, you know, situation is completely different. And we actually exploit this particular uh, property. Yeah. Now, we can prove the following thing. Um, if we can solve uh, distinguishing problem on the average, okay, so that the pi is actually randomly generated and given as a, uh, and then we have to distinguish into the two states, rho plus and rho minus, right? Now, if this is easy, then, well, we can solve the same problem even in the worst case. So this actually shows that in the worst case, complexity is equivalent to the average case complexity. Not many problems have this problem. Usually, you know, the average case complexity is much, much smaller than worst case complexity. And another uh, interesting thing is that uh, if we can solve, um, okay, if we can solve the, uh, the distinguishing problem, then we can solve the classical uh, problem called GA, so the graph of multiple problem. So that, so this is the problem uh, for the input. If the uh, yes, uncorrected graph is given, then so we have to uh, check whether G has a non-trivial automorphism or not. This is actually the uh, you know, special case of the graph isomorphism problem. And GA is not known to be NP intercept point. Uh, surely you know, this is known to NP, but you know, it's not known in P, even if it's NP intercept point. So it's much higher uh, about P. So now, uh, finally, we come to the uh, end of the talk. So we'll be able to secure quantum uh, public key cryptosystem. Okay. Now the system works like this. Now so Alice wants to send one classical bit to Bob. Okay. And there is a quantum channel laid out between Alice and Bob. And there is an evil Eve person trying to eavesdrop the conversation. Okay? Now, so now our system goes like this one. Alice has one bit called B. This is a classical one bit. And then she wants to send this one into Bob. So, the first of generate, randomly generate a decryption key pi, or well, that's a permutation, and a corresponding to a corresponding quantum state, rho plus. And this one is used as an encryption key. And the pi is a decryption key. <coughs> so Bob transmits this encryption key to everyone. So even there's an anomaly. Uh, if receive the same row plus as Alice does. So Alice, according to uh, her bit, classical bit, if 
her bit is zero, then she just do nothing, just you know, keep row, row plus. That is the qubit sent from above. If her bit is one, then she flip the sign plus to minus. Now you remember that you know, the flipping sign is very easy. Just simply apply the phase transition. Now she send this qubit back to Bob. Possibly if if strong the conversation. So she gets the same qubit, right? Uh, uh, the quantum state. Now, if does not know pi, because the pi is hidden by the bottom, right? So Bob can possibly decode the message and receive uh, to obtain the big D because then he knows pi. But if <coughs> she does not know anything about pi, so she has no idea you know, which qubit are actually being received. So this is the whole entire uh, the description of the system. And this system is secure unless GP, GA, is the graph of automorphism, is solved by a quantum computer in polynomial time. Um, the future direction might, uh, uh, corresponding to the, the today's topic, might be, uh, you know, we can actually, you know, further uh, study the quantum uh, cryptographic primitives, not necessarily just you know, the <coughs> public key, public key the encryption schemes, but we can actually uh, think about the quantum commitment, the quantum you know, previous transfer, zero knowledge proof system, and so on. And um, also, you know, we have to uh, think about you know, the kind of relations among the complexity of classes. And if something like a, like a uh, distinguishability problem, then if this is solvable in a polynomial time in a quantum computer, then you know, in the classical sense, you know, the classical problem is also solved or something like that. Okay? And also, you know, we have to actually you know, find much more efficient well, Anton, I want to tell you one thing. We have a, uh, uh, well, this is actually the, the very first uh, quantum uh, public key uh, encryption scheme. But uh, this is not really efficient because there is you no, know, for one qubit, or uh, one single bit to be sent, you have to actually produce um, logarithmically many quantum bits. Right? It's not really efficient in the, in the, in the practical sense. Logarithm in what? Uh, in. Oh, the size, oh, sorry, uh, um, 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 okay, so if you want to send n bits, sorry, sorry, <laughs> n, n, n classical bits, then you have to have you know, log logarithmically many, uh, uh, oh, sorry, no, 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 yes, you know, to, um, n, n is the, um, uh, uh, n is the size of pi. And um, the reference, um, we have uh, tons of uh, uh, the textbooks uh, regarding the quantum computation and quantum information theory, and uh, uh, more books are coming. <laughs> well, thank you very much for listening. Actually, both of them. You know, so you really need you know, sort of the precise precision right. to get the information right. right. right? Because you know, the particle itself is so tiny. Right. 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 Yeah. So that's you know, sort of one big thing. So that is you know, a lot of you know, physicists and the engineers, you know, they come up and you know, try to come up with you know, some 
you know, innovative idea to you know to stabilize you know, the particles so that you know we can actually well uh, the, as you see the quantum computation is actually rotation of the particle that's it right so that you have to actually trap the particle and then rotate in the pre in, in the precise precision so that's the you know the really hard part because then usually you know all the particles are moving around do do you have any predictions for the outlook Future. Um, I don't know. Um, seven qubits now, and we're going to get to ten. <laughs> <laughs> well, ten, ten would be great, but you know, so that a lot of people try to get you know, hundred qubits. You know, that yeah. actually solved you know, a whole bunch of you know, the existing problems, I guess. I mean, but yeah, do you think there's hope for hundred qubits? Um, well, years, you know, so, you know, several years ago, you know, people talk about maybe in the you know, 50 years from now, some people say 100 years from now. You know, yeah, you can actually see that in a long span, you know. It's not like a tomorrow or day after tomorrow <laughs> when we get a laptop computer, a laptop quantum computer. <laughs> Anybody else? There's a question. So, uh, you mentioned the um, permutation group. Mm -hmm. This is kind of core of the, the code. So, uh, is it kind of, could it be generalized to other types of groups or maybe there is a class of, of groups? Uh, could be. And what kind of properties? Uh, um, well, at least you know, we need, um, I just, just to bring it back several slides back um, here. Um, at least you know, we, we can easily manipulate uh, Suppose you know, you know, we are using a two quantum state, right? So we can actually flip those you know, tra you know, trans tra you know, the transform it into two qubits very easy way, in a very efficient way. And also, we have to have some hidden information. That is the key to open uh, quantum state, right? But then if you don't know this key, you, know, you can't do anything. So that's a trapdoor problem. So this is actually a very important problem to to implement something. So, so those are at least, you know, uh, the, the property that you know, we have to really keep in mind. Do you have any idea, you know, uh, something that actually fit into these conditions? That would be a great, you know, so we can develop you know, a much better you know, system somehow. So the graph automorphism, so you, you've got um, public key that's secure subject to that. Are there any other now public key that is secure subject to anything else? Um, some people actually develop, you know, based on the knapsack problem. But in you know, a slightly different way, you know, because um, we did not follow that direction uh, in this work. We actually come up with you know, the totally different things. Like, you know, distinguishing is hard, distinguishing easy, that's the, you know, the way we started with, uh, you know, uh, in the, in the eventually we actually ended up with this uh, graph automobiles. We didn't intend to discuss this one at the very <laughs> beginning. Yeah. But it's better to have a much more natural, you know, like, you know, close to NP complete problems. Yeah. Because this might possibly stay very close to P yeah. somehow. But the knapsack one is, I mean, it's the proper version that's NP hard they can do or not? Oh, uh, well, they, they, they can't develop you know, the same kind of the public key system. Yeah. You know, they're, they're really weaker ones. Okay. But these things you know, in a practical you know, point of view, you know, uh, maybe do we, re we really need to kind of you know, secure the, the, you know, the transmission of the classical bits you know, using you know, the very small number of qubits. Okay. Thanks very much.